And you know this next Thursday, <laughs> this next Thursday will be the the fourth, right? So we won't be meeting that evening. You should be doing something spiritual like shooting off fireworks and stuff, you know. But uh, uh, we've been talking about the truth about it is, is that he said that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give us the desires of our heart. And so we've been talking about what is it to delight yourself in the Lord? Well, obviously one thing is, is it means that uh, uh, what God wants is what we want. Uh, if there's anything frustrating for a pastor, I, I know one thing that's frustrating for a pastor, and that's to talk to people that are shacked up together, not married, having sex outside of marriage, or involved in all kinds of different things, and it doesn't bother them. That's frustrating. If it bothered them, you'd know that they delight themselves in the Lord, and you want to help those people. But some people you can't help if they're in open sin and they don't care about it, which means that's the very definition of rebellion. Well, they still think because if they attend church, then they're delighting themselves in the Lord, but that's not it. It's where's your heart with God, amen? Are we really delighting, which means that are we worshiping God? Are we trying to live for God? Are we trying to live the way that we should? Um, I was dealing with... a a leader in another church one time and I said you know what uh, I know you went through a nasty divorce but the fact that you went for a nasty divorce does not mean you ought to be shacked up with somebody today well I'll never get married again so you're going to live like man and wife but you're not going to get married well that's right and I said well then you're in rebellion well that was highly offensive to him and let me tell you I don't care if it was offensive to him because I have to preach the truth amen now, when somebody wants to live the way that God wants them to live, we as Christians want to help them. And when people struggle with a sin, it said, let those who are spiritual restore such a one. So we ought to be the spiritual ones helping other people. That doesn't mean going around judging everybody. It just means this right here. When they're struggling, go to them in love and say, I'm here beside you to help you through this thing. That's what you want to do. But don't go, but don't go and tell them, well, I know you're, 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 you're involved in that sin, but don't worry about it. It's no big deal. God loves you. He's a good God. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. He's a jealous God, too. He wants to be number one in your life. Amen? And he is so delighted in you. Remember what he said in Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He'll save. He'll rejoice over thee. We talked about the fact that means that he's literally leaping over you with singing. He really, uh, you, he's so delighted in you because you know him uh, that it puts a song in his heart. Amen? And so that's who he is. He said, he will joy over thee with singing. And the Bible tells us, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, with everything that we have. Philippians 3.3, 3, Paul said it like this. We are the circumcision, or the real believers, who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. Now watch this. And have no confidence in the flesh. That's a pretty strong verse, isn't it? That means I'm not trusting in the things that I want, but I'm trusting that what God wants for me is more important than the things that I want. Amen? True story. A conference at a Presbyterian church in Omaha, people were given helium-filled balloons and told to release them at some point in the service when they felt like expressing the joy in their hearts. Since they were extremely reserved Presbyterians, they weren't free to say hallelujah or praise the Lord outside, uh, out loud. All through the service, balloons ascended, but when it was over, a third of the balloons were unreleased. So what am I saying to you tonight? Let your balloon go. Worship the Lord. Find your joy in worshiping the Lord. Let your balloon go. Let your balloon go. Rejoice in the Lord. Paul said it like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. As long as you're as rejoicing in the Lord, you're going to draw closer and closer to him. Amen? His love demands that we reciprocate uh, the love that he's shown us, that we turn it back to him. John Wesley one of the founders of what they know, what we know as the Methodist Church today, John Wesley, the Wesley boys were very evangelistic people. But he said, John Wesley was about 21 years of age when he went to Oxford University. 
He came from a Christian home, and he was gifted with a keen mind and good looks. Yet in those days, he was a bit snobbish and sarcastic. One night, however, something happened that set in motion a change in Wesley's heart. While speaking with a porter, he discovered that the poor fellow had only one coat and lived in such impoverished conditions that he didn't even have a bed. Yet he was an unusually happy person filled with gratitude to God. Wesley, being an immature, thoughtlessly joked with the man's misfortunes. What else do you thank God for? He said with a touch of sarcasm. The, uh, the man smiled and the spirit of meekness replied with joy. I thank him that he's given me my life and being, a heart to love him, and above all, a constant desire to serve him. Deeply moved, Wesley recognized that this man knew the meaning of true thankfulness. Many years later, in 1791, John Wesley lay in the deathbed at the age of 88. Lesson of praising God in every circumstance. Despite Wesley's extreme weakness, he began singing the hymn, I'll praise my maker while I still have breath. John writes, here in his love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. We love God today. We delight in God because he first delighted in us. It's not like, it's not the way it was really preached to me by many preachers when I was growing up, that if I love God, serve him enough and everything else, I'm going to find the favor of God. I already have the favor of God. I need to praise him for who he is and what he's done in my life already. Amen? Peter, he understood intimacy with God. And come on, did you ever meet him more impetuous than Peter? I mean, I don't know why Jesus didn't slap him into next week several times, you know. But Peter's the one that said in 1 Peter 1, 8, whom, whom having not seen, you love. Whom, though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the relationship that we can have to, uh, with God today, that we have joy unspeakable, and we can praise him with our whole hearts because of what he's already done. Amen? And yet I like that Hebrew word, uh, todah. The Hebrew word todah means to praise God for things that you have not received yet. That's praising him in faith, isn't it? Thank God for this and thank God for that. I love it. There's something. We, we don't wake up one day, decide to walk away from our sins and turn to Jesus. No, the Spirit of God reached down and grabbed a hold of, of, of Christina and, and said, if anybody needs me, she does. And so he reached down. But that's true of all of us, isn't it? When people say, I was searching for God. No, you're too stupid to search for God. God came after us. I mean, you know, that's it. Come on. And really, he's the one that made the move for us. But worship. There's something I love about worship. Did you know when I first got saved, and I was teasing people before this, but when I first got saved, though, I did not like worship music at all. I remember telling Debbie, I said, I don't even get it. She goes, what is it you don't get? I don't get worship music. I said, why is it Motown moves me more than worship music? She goes, I don't know, because some of those words ain't so good. So I started listening to some of the words, you know, and if, if I'm listening and singing along with, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. That's not a very Christian attitude to have, is it? You know what I'm saying? But did you know, as I grew in the Lord, now watch this, as you grow in intimacy with the Lord, you don't even have to know a worship song. Worship starts just coming out of you. Amen? Worship isn't just singing. It's a life poured out in adoration of God. And so I love that, and the, and, and, and the more I enjoyed. We were, uh, Kathy uh, told us, uh, reminded me to, today or yesterday, whenever it was, you sent a thing about when <coughs> Kathy and myself and Debbie went to a worship seminar by Terry McCalman out in uh, Colorado, and also uh, Driscoll was there, wasn't he? Oh, Phil Driscoll was there playing, and Terry McCalman, and the worship experience was unbelievable. And yet, when I first got saved, that wouldn't have thrilled me at all. I thought there's, there's not enough... You know, it didn't move me. 
Now, I want, I'm only saying this to make a point. When you're still closer to the world, then worldly music still means more to you. But as you grow closer to God, worship starts meaning more and more. And I appreciate the people of this church. You know, I didn't appreciate worship as much uh, when the church first started as it did when Ruth Ann back there came here. And she knows every hymn there is to know. And she knew all these different songs. And you know what? And so when I started, we started to do it, started the early service, and I started seeing the words in some of them old songs. I thought, oh, my gosh. They're beautiful words, well-written words with deep theological themes to them. And I thought, man, you can't beat that. Worship changes us. Why does it change us? We're talking about intimacy with God. We're talking about delighting in the Lord. Why does worship change you? Because you are what you think. And you have what you say. You are what you think. You have what you say. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as, a, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Jesus said it like this, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and evil men out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Years ago, I had a man just rail on me about something, you know. And he came back later and said, man, I didn't mean that. I said, yes, you did. He goes, no, no. He said, I really didn't mean it. Yes, you did. You may not mean it now, but you meant it when you said it. It was out of the abundance of your heart that that statement came out. We ought to watch what we say. Amen? And praise gives us an opportunity to love God, and not just to love God, but to show the people around us that we love God. It's a great testimony. It's a great witness to other people when we're singing songs like that. I love it. Remember what Jesus said, Whatsoever shall say, uh, uh, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, this is a deeper statement than what people give it. But shall believe that the things that he saith. I want you to say, I believe in the things that I say. So I'll have what I say. Now, if you lived that life, you'd certainly watch what you say, wouldn't you? Newspaper columnist and, and minister George Crane tells of a wife who came into the office full of hatred toward her husband. I do not only want to get rid of him, I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has me. Dr. Crane suggested an ingenious plan. Go home and act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to be kind, considerate, and generous as possible. Spare no efforts to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. After you've convinced him of your undying love, that you cannot live without him, then drop the bomb. Tell him that you're getting a divorce. That will really hurt him. With revenge in her eyes, she smiled, exclaimed, Beautiful, beautiful. Will he ever be surprised? And she did it with enthusiasm, acting a, a, as if for two months she showed love, kindness, listening, giving, reinforcing, sharing. When she didn't return, Crane called her and said, Are you ready now to go through a divorce? She said, Divorce? Never. I really love this man. Her actions and her feelings are dictated by the things, the thoughts that she had and the things that she was saying. You need to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then you need to love your neighbor as you do yourself. I like this, uh, I like this uh, that I read. Courage. You can stand strong in the face of fear. And I've read this story a bit many years ago, but I want to read it to you now. Ted Stollard undoubtedly qualifies as a one of the least. Turned off by school. Very sloppy in appearance. Expressionless. Unattractive. Even his teacher, Miss Thompson, enjoyed bearing down her red pen as she placed X's beside his many wrong answers. If only she had studied his records more carefully. They read, First grade, Ted shows promise with his work and attitude but has poor home situation. Second grade, Ted could do better, 
Mother seriously ill, receives little help from home. Third grade. Ted is a good boy, but too serious. He's a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade. Ted is very slow, but well behaved. His father shows no interest whatsoever. Christmas arrived. The children piled elaborately wrapped gifts on their teacher's desk. Ted Stollard brought one, too. It was wrapped in brown paper and held together with scotch tape. Miss Thompson opened each gift as the children crowded around to watch. Out of Ted's package fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet and half the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. The children began to snicker, but she silenced them by splashing some of the perfume on her wrist and letting them smell it. She put the bracelet on, too. At day's end, after the children had left, Ted came by his teacher's desk and said, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And the bracelet looks real pretty on you. I'm glad you like my presence. He left. Miss Thompson got down on her knees and asked God to forgive her and to change her attitude. The next day, the children were greeted by a reformed teacher, one committed to loving each of them, especially the slow ones, especially Ted. Surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, Ted began to show great improvement. He actually caught up with most of the students and even passed a few. Time came and went. Miss Thompson heard nothing from Ted for a long time. Then one day she received this note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted, to be the first, uh, I wanted you to be the first to know. I'll be graduating second in my class. Love, Ted. Four years later, another note arrived. Dear Miss Thompson, they just told me I'll be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know. The university has not been easy, but I liked it. Love, Ted. And four years later, dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, Stollard, M.D. How about that? I want you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month, the 27th to be exact. I want you to come and sit where my mother would have sat had she lived. You're the only family I have now. Dad died last year. Miss Thompson attended that wedding and sat where Ted's mother would have sat. The compassion she had shown that young man entitled her to that privilege. Let's have some real courage and start giving to one of the leagues. He may become a Ted Stollard, and even if that doesn't happen, he'll have been faithful to the one who's always treated us as unworthy as we are, like very special people. I love that story. Let me tell you something. Loving God with everything that you have and loving other people transforms you and transforms the world around you transforms you we went to uh we went to eat last night before we went to watch carol king beautiful at starlight and uh, we went to a uh, smokehouse and this girl came up the waitress and she said uh, uh can i take your order and stuff i said oh that's a beautiful what does the feather signify she had a tattoo of a feather on her wrist and, uh, and I said, it says free. What are you free from? And a tear started coming out. She goes, that's no big deal. I didn't have a very good childhood. No big deal. Let's get on with the order. I said, can I tell you something? I said, I'm going to write down my, my phone number because it's the one time I didn't come with my card. And uh, I'm going to write down my phone number on this napkin. And I said, I want you to know you can call me anytime." And you, I, you don't even have to have an answer from me. You can call and say, I just want to talk. And I'll let you talk. And I'll listen. And I said, because you have, you have made a friend today. She was shaken by that. But did you know, we have impact in this world. And did you know that God can change the world with a worshiper? Somebody who is in love with God. You know, the Bible says that if you say you love God, but you hate man, you're a liar. Because God loves people. Amen. And so we can love people. We can do that. Two not grievous commands at all. To love God and love people. If a man say I love God and hateth his brother. He's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him. That he who loveth God. Loveth his brother also.
all communion and all intimacy with God is cut off when we are not allowing the love of God. Remember I, I taught last week or week before that it is receiving God's love which is hard for some people to do to know that they're loved and then returning that love you don't have the ability to love until you've received God's love and uh, and what do we know about that do you remember what we what, what we learned about it that God's love for us was marked uh, uh, by rejoicing by resting and rejoicing he rested in what he did for us in his love for us and he rejoiced in what he had done with us you know what our love for God is done how it's we express it through resting in his love and trusting in his love and rejoicing in what he's done upon that cross amen all intimacy with the Lord is cut off when we have an unloving an unforgiving attitude toward another person the Bible says that you're acting like a liar I remember having a couple in front of me one time and uh, uh, doing some counseling with the word with them and and uh, she said I hate him right there in front of her husband I hate him no you love him I think I would know how I feel no no I'm telling you right now that the real you loves your husband well what do you mean by that well I mean this that God is love and if you're indwelt by God the real you always loves now maybe your emotions are not good maybe you have some anger and bitterness to deal with but the real spiritual man is still in love with your husband and guess what your husband's spiritual man is in love with you because that's all God is says so first John 4 17 I think it God is love God is love it doesn't say God is a good church service it says God is love if you're in that state where you have bitterness towards somebody that's wronged you you need to start out by saying Lord I'm sorry forgive me for not having the same attitude that you have towards me one of grace and forgiveness and then go to that person as God's word instructs and be reconciled with them first be reconciled to thy brother and then come offer thy gift first Peter second nine said but you're a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation I like what Paul said to the church at Corinth. Do you know what he said? He said, there's divisions among you. And when there are divisions among you, aren't you acting like mere men? I love that. Mere men. What's that mean? As believers, we're not mere men. We're like Abraham. We, he, Abram was Abram Hom, which was Abram plus God. We are Christians. And so we're not mere men. We're supernatural men and women who have the ability to love the way that God loves. We have the ability to do as Jesus did while he was being offended. It says in 1 Peter, the second chapter, that he didn't answer back. But he committed them to the one who judges righteously. We have the ability to love those who don't love us. We have the ability to love our enemy. You're a chosen generation, 1 Peter 2, 9, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And I don't think he meant just heart of God, although we are kind of peculiar. That he should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When God's glory is revealed, you're not ashamed to rejoice in free worship. I don't even know how to describe. Somebody said, what's the best worship service you've ever had? And I told them, I said, me on my motorcycle or me inside of my pickup, driving down the road, I'm not singing a song at all. I may be singing just whatever's on my heart. 
And I tell you what, I'll have such a tremendous experience of God because it's just me and God. I'm worshiping Him. I'm not worshiping so other people can hear me. I'm worshiping God, telling Him how much I love Him. Amen? I love going down the road and listening to the message on, on Sirius uh, Radio, you know, and, and, and the great songs on that. You can rest in your relationship in Christ. You can express freely your love for God's children. You can actually uh, live a life that says, I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's the power of God and the salvation. Amen? I remember I wrote this down because of, we used to read it periodically. It says, I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast and I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by presence, learn by faith, and love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my God is reliable, my mission is clear. I can't be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, diluted, or delayed. I'll not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, back up, let up, shut up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until he returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. I love it. That's our statement, isn't it? Hallelujah. Some people think getting excited isn't dignified. But delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. Next, not this coming Thursday, but Thursday after that, we're still talking about delighting in the Lord, and, and I'll start with making right choices in life and delighting in the Lord. And the whole sermon is really directed toward Jeff, but you guys can come and listen to it. Aren't you glad I didn't pick on Carol Statham tonight? That's the making right choices amen hallelujah i need to get that printed up again you got it in your computer print it up and we'll we'll get it out to everybody it's a great thing to read periodic remember who we are i was just telling debbie the other day i feel a renewed energy coming on me i know i'm close to getting a new kidney but whatever it takes i know i'm going to have energy again and there's some things i want to do there's some things I want to do that I haven't been able to do. I haven't, honestly, just haven't had the energy to do. But, um, but you'll see what some of them are. I'm going to grab some people and some lawn mowers and go down the street and, like we did years ago, yep. and mow lawns, paint houses. They're going to know heart of God is here. Yes, and, uh, and that's what we're building bridges. You know, we're letting people know that we're serious about our walk with God. Amen. Yeah. Let me tell you something. We decided a long time ago when everybody, when we first got here, and they were, there were so many rumors about that weird biker church. 
we were in the little building over there and everybody was talking about it and then we had that biker Sunday and everyone was drinking in clear plastic glasses and amber liquid which was iced tea and on that Monday morning I came back and I went down to the little restaurant and they said we heard you guys had a real kegger up there <laughs> no iced tea hot dogs that's what we had you know what I'm saying and uh, but we had trouble breaking in and and so uh, uh, I met with the leadership I said we're going to become the giving his church in this town whenever they need something we're going to be there and I remember one of the first things we did was they used to have the mayor's Christmas tree dinner and auction, which we still have here. And uh, they said, man, it takes up so much of the money to get that thing catered. And, and I said, we'll pay it. And I remember one of the pastors said, don't you need to go back and talk to the board? I said, what did it cost you last year to, to, pay, to pay a caterer to do that? $500? I said, we'll pay it. Well, I'd get fired if I made a decision like that. I said, the difference is between you and me is if the church didn't like it, I'd pay for it myself. <laughs> but we're going to take care of that dinner. And we decided from that point on that when the community needed something, we were going to be there. And, uh, and we're going to get back to some more that I want the community to know. I'm glad that we're going out and feeding homeless and stuff like that. But right here in our communities, our local communities, I want them to see us down on the streets dealing with people, loving on people. Amen? Amen. And so I'm excited about it. We, we're going to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength, and love our neighbors. We do ourselves. You receive that tonight? Amen. Amen. Let's stand our feet. We're glad Lindsay came. We were going to quit having it if you hadn't come. That's the whole deal. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Let's just raise our hands and say, Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you rejoice over me with singing. You are delighted in me. And Lord, I'm delighted in you. I will live a life of worship and consecration. I will love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I will love my neighbor. I will be obedient to your word. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And the plate's always up here to put your hundreds and hundreds of dollars in. <laughs>